Hello, I'm Jeremy, and today I'm going to take a look at a game published by Robinsberger. Uh, this is a German version of the game um, that is coming to U.S., as I understand. Uh, should be available around August of 2018. Uh, the game is named Woodlands, and this is a 2-4 player uh, simultaneous puzzle solving game uh, where players are going to be trying to lay down tiles on a grid to create a path for a character to collect various treasures and avoid various obstacles. It has a nice fairy tale theming that does make it look like a kid's game, but uh, I'll note that the box says ages 10 and up, which I think is probably about right. This game starts pretty simple, but it gets uh, more complex with rules, rules-wise, um, as it goes. So I think with certain children might get frustrated because there's a lot of potential to lose negative points. There's also a speed element, which could be frustrating for kids. Uh, the box says that it plays in about 20 to 40 minutes. I would say 20 to 30 in most cases, um, although maybe it would take a little longer with the more complex levels, um, possibly. But, you know, it's more of a filler weight length game. So let me take a minute to show you how the game works, and I will come back and let you know what I think about it. In Woodlands, every player is going to get one of these uh, boards that represents the uh, landscape where they're going... In Woodlands, every player is going to get one of these boards, which represents a landscape where they're going to be moving their player pawn across at the end of the, the round. They're trying to collect the various treasures and avoid various obstacles that are shown on this board. So this board here is actually a transparency that's uh, placed uh, on this you know white background in the center of the table for all players to see. Then each player is going to take their individual board and orient it so that the top of this little marker would correspond with whichever position this is. Um, the top of the marker here, this, I guess, scroll on this board is facing. So it doesn't really matter if you're sitting across the table from it. If you know, if this was this way, all you would do is simply rotate this. So this would be this way. Otherwise, you know, position doesn't matter. And this is going to be a uh, speed puzzle game. And in this game, uh, it's going to be played, there are four essentially stories included with the game. Each of them is based on a fairy tale. Um, and the introductory one is Little Red Riding Hood, corresponds with this figure. And that's going to be a puzzle, or a, uh, I guess a game played over four different chapters. And the easiest chapter, chapter one, you can see here, the players are going to be controlling Little Red Riding Hood, who's going to start where this icon is. And they're going to be trying to place these path tiles on their board, so that you can see these path, these tiles that players have. They each have an equal set of these, um, are going to be marked with either pass or forest. So when the round begins, each player simultaneously is going to be assigning these tiles to these nine spaces on their board, um, with the goal being that they put Little Red Riding Hood on a path that will lead to Grandma's house and then also lead her to these various treasures. So you can see there's on each of these sheets a little scoring legend that tells you um, both what chapter you're in and then how you'll score. So if we get a path with Little Red Riding Hood to Grandma's house, we are going to get three points. If we get for every strawberry that we pick up, we will get a point. And then there's also this gem that you could collect, which would be end game points. So um, when the round is ready and every player has you know their board ready, um, you will flip this over, and then simultaneously players are going to just start you know looking at this and using this to determine where they're going to place each of these pieces. So this is going to happen simultaneously. When one player feels like they've placed um, everything. And I should note, if ever you don't cover up one of these spaces, that's a minus one point. But when one player feels confident in their selections, they're going to take this and put that in front of them. If it's not run out yet, um, they'll wait till it runs out, and then they'll flip it. Um, for being the first player to finish in a round, they're also going to get one of these white gems, which is essentially a wild gem at the end of the game, will be wor worth one point. So once they flip it, other players will have one more time through the uh, sand glass um, to finish laying their tiles. So if nobody takes it after it runs out the first time for, for you know, another minute, that's fine. It's just as soon as a, one player finishes, the other players are just going to have one more. This is about 30 seconds, 45 seconds through the uh, sand timer to, to complete their puzzles. So once the sand timer runs out the second time, you'll say stop. All players are going to stop. So, you know, then I actually cheated here. I 
made a completed thing, then each player is going to basically check their work. And the way that you're going to do that is you're going to take the transparency and lay it over the top of every player's board so that this matches, you know, this uh, banner here matches the right position in their board. And then the game comes with a pawn for the Little Red Riding Hood. And what you're going to do is you're going to place it on the pawn and see if you could trace a route to all the various things. Now you could um, always double back on the route. It doesn't have to be one contiguous route. So you could see like here, this little red riding hood would be able to make it to the path, the uh, sign that points to grandmother's house. And she could make it to all of these strawberries here and go here, get a yellow gem. Unfortunately for this strawberry, she would not be able to reach it because it's in the forest. She can't go from the path to the forest. So she would get... Um, three points, the gem, four, five, six, seven points for that round, not getting that last point. So that would be how you would do the first round. Then you would just go on to the uh, second round. So the uh, second round, and I'll just show you some of these. And uh, I should know that you you would just record your scores on like a pad of paper or what have you. So the second round, uh, just to show you some of the variety that the game has, the second round has you on this path and essentially you have to collect or every one of these green mushrooms that you collect would be a point every one of the red mushrooms that you walk into while you're going around your path is a negative point there's some gems to collect then um from the second round on in every uh level there's going to be this um this goblet which functions essentially as a catch-up mechanism and the way that this works is whoever the player or players are in the lead have to connect to that goblet or else they're going to lose three points at the end of the round. The players who aren't in the lead don't even have to worry about that, so it's not going to affect them positively or negative. It just adds an extra obstacle or an, another objective for the player who's in the lead to complete. Um, there's also on here this key. If ever you get your character to the key, you get to take a key token. Uh, that will enable you to open a treasure chest on certain maps, which would then let you take one of these cards. And uh, these cards are generally going to be, uh, I should know I did pay stuffs for these. I had a German language version. Um, these cards are going to generally be uh, take that or just a small benefit for the player who gets them. Um, so like this one is, in the next round, a player of your choice must use a weaker hand to place tiles. So the way that those work is you, Sometimes we'll have to, you know, for example, swap a tile with another player, or you can force a player to use a tile like this one in their board, or like this one where if that could reach their character, they'll lose three points. So it gives them another challenge to work with, um, typically speaking. So that would be like level two, and these ramp up in, so the Little Red Riding Hood is the simplest one. These ramp up in um, complexity quite a bit, actually. So this one here, um, you know, same objectives. There's the treasure chest that you could use the key on. Um, if she makes it to grandma's house, she's going to get 10 points. But here it has these foxes and bunnies. And the way that these work is that any fox that could reach a bunny um, will make you lose a point. And the foxes basically could travel along um, forests or along uh, any path to reach the bunny. So for example, if we had this tile back behind here, that fox would be able to reach the bunny because he would be able to go over there and eat the bunny and that would cause you to lose points. And then the uh, the fourth level for the easy easy part is this Little Red Riding Hood. So we have uh, Little Red Riding Hood and her grandma. If we could create a path from her to the grandma, we get six points. And we have a uh, a path from the hunter to the uh, wolf for six points. If ever you put a forest behind a forest fire, fire, you're going to lose three points. And the catch on this one is, you know, you have to connect a path from here to here, and you have to connect a path from here to here. But if the wolf could reach either grandma or a uh, little riding hood, you won't get points for the round. You'll lose points. Um, you'll only get any gems that you would have collected. Um, I should note, though, although a lot of these maps have the potential to lose points, you are never going to be able to go below zero for a given round. So that's what one base, the basic level would look like. But there's a lot of uh, different ways that you could change the difficulty in this. First of all, every single map you could put over one of two overlays. So this one here would add special objectives, which... You know, if you could reach the unicorn on this, you'll just automatically get a treasure chest. And if the fairy could reach this, um, 
this rose, that would be also worth six points. And that could be added onto any map to basically boost the scoring possibilities. And then there's another one that just makes things more difficult. You could also add that one on there. And so now you can see you have to worry about, you know, if you collect this holly, that's four points. If this guy could reach your, your figure, that's going to be minus three points. And then you lose points if you go over these spaces. So minus five points, three points, two points, two points, one points. So you could ramp up the difficulty even of the basic level. But beyond that, there are also, um, like I said, three other stories. So that first story is four levels long. Some of them are five levels long. There's a Robin Hood story. So you see here you have Robin Hood here, has to collect his merry men, and wants to avoid the wolves, that sort of thing. Then there is a King Arthur story. And you want to collect these various, um, I guess, elements that prove you're the king and avoid these other knights. That's... And then finally, there's a uh, Count Dracula story. So, you know, you play Jonathan Harker, I suppose, there. And, for example, in this one, you want to get to the wooden stake, but you want to also make sure the light could hit, still hit Dracula. You don't want to block that with any forests, that sort of thing. And then, um, yeah, so you have to go to the stake and then back to the coffin as well. So you can see that the game, these definitely get more complex uh, as you go. There's more rules on them. Um, but generally speaking, you'll play uh, through all of the chapters in one story, and then whoever has the most points for that chapter is going to be the winner. Um, the gems that you collect along the way are going to add to those points, I should mention. So there are four colors of gems, um, and these are worth one point each. Unless you have a set of four, then they're worth five. And the white gems that you get, which you'll generally get for being the first person finishing around and grabbing the hourglass. Those could be a wild, so like if I had those three, I could complete the set with the white gem. That would be worth five points. So those get added to the points that you've earned during the chapters. Again, whoever has the most points is going to be the winner of Woodlands. Alright, so that is Woodlands. And um, this is a game that feels pretty unique, even though there are a lot of similar games in this vein. There are, you know, games like Karubo or Take It Easy, um, which, you know, have you, you know, laying tiles to your own player board in order to get the best score. Uh, the things that really set this one apart are both, you know, the use of those transparencies. There are other games that have used transparencies, of course, like Doodle Quest or Looney Quest. Those games, um, have you drawing on the transparencies. Uh, but this one uses those to change the way that this puzzle works slightly. So, the fact that you're not really looking directly at your player board to determine where you're going, but having to transpose what you see in the center of the table back onto your player board just makes it a slightly different puzzle than something that, you know, um, you would be normally doing in a game like this. Also, the real-time element, which is, I think, going to be the most controversial thing about this game, um, is something that, you know, distinguishes this from other games of its sort. You are going to be under time pressure to create the best uh, situation that you could. I mean, this game would be solvable if you had unlimited amount of time. You could just find the very best path every time. You know, you all have the same tiles. There's going to be a single solution to any of the puzzles that you're going to be working on. But because there's time pressure um, and there's penalties if you don't uh, finish covering up your board, you know, within a certain proximity of time to the leader, um, and there's also an incentive to just, you know, be the first to finish in a given round. Because of all those elements, you're going to be making mistakes just because you're trying to do things quickly. And um, the s examples that I showed you were the easier examples. Definitely, as it goes um, on into the other stories, it adds complexity. And if you change any of those boards with those modifier uh, screens that you could add even more rules on top of them. Uh, the game becomes almost mind-melting because of the time pressure, um, trying to make sure that you're maximizing points. It becomes very difficult, I think, for... Um, or surprisingly difficult is, I guess, a better way to put it. It looks like a family game. It looks like, actually like a kid's game because of the fairy tale theme, but I would say it's definitely more of a, a family game. It's a game that I think young children could get frustrated with. I think it's a game that will play better with some mixture of adults to be able to explain the rules if you're going to have you know some older kids in the mix or it's fine with just all adults the 10 and up on the box i think is is probably appropriate because the rules are going to be changing every round and you want to make sure that everybody's understanding those rules as you go so because it's one of the it's a game that essentially has a time element 
And you, despite the fact that the rules change from round to round, you're always going to be doing the same basic puzzle. Uh, there is definite chance for there to be a player who's you know strictly better at doing this sort of thing than other players at the game. A lot of games have these single um, skills that they're testing throughout, you know, and usually they're filler games. And this is definitely one of those games. If a player is really great at spatial puzzles, they'll probably do better at this game. There is a catch-up mechanism where the player or players who are in the lead are going to have to collect those chalices every round. That gives you an extra thing to worry about. And then a lot of these cards, which I really didn't show too many of, um, a lot of these cards have essentially target another player. So, you know, make another player use their left hand instead of their right hand, or um, make a player play with their board rotated around upside down and still have to complete their puzzle. Um, these are definitely um, things that could, you know, help mitigate that to a certain degree. If, if everybody at the table knows that one player is really great at the game, they could just give them extra challenges by collecting those treasures. So usually I think that take that elements in games um, are you know not especially fun or especially fair, but in a game where you're only really testing one skill and a game where that's going to determine you know who wins if they if somebody's strictly better at that, you know these actually do help to equalize things a little bit. I I, I mean I find playing this to be pretty easy, but like if I have to play it with my board upside down versus the board in the center, all of a sudden I have an incredibly difficult time, and I've lost a game because of that already. So there is that element of it, I guess. You know, again, that's another reason why maybe younger kids might not like that, that take that element. Maybe kids do like that. I'm not I'm not sure. It depends on the kid, I suppose. But um, that that is actually a, a rare instance where I think that take that element does help to equalize it, just because... Um, skill levels could be so lopsided and it could help to correct that. Um, overall, I think that there's a lot of variety in the box. There's something like, um, I believe about 20, maybe 18 to 20 of those uh, individual screens, plus you can modify the, each one with two more things. So, and a single playthrough of which there are four different stories to go through probably takes about you know 20 to 30 minutes so it's going to take you a while to go through all of these. You could theoretically sit here and memorize these puzzles um, and you know what an optimal solution is, but because you know people could swap out your tiles, because you could modify them with other you know overlays, the chance of really solving the game I think goes a little bit out the window um, because there's just too many permutations possible. Uh, so it's really a unique uh, family game. It's one that's a lot of fun. Like I said, it's coming to the U.S. I believe it, later this year. Uh, and I would recommend it. It's, it's definitely worth trying. It, if it looks like something that would appeal to you, it probably would. Um, the, the art is a little bit uninspired, but I guess they're picking functionality, functionality and clarity of you know the various icons over you know great art. Um, and also, it does work uh, that regardless of what direction that you're looking at it from. Um, it does work. You're able to clearly see what you're trying to do. So I guess that's more important than you know having pretty art. Uh, this is, you know, simply functional art, you know, uh, but it's a really terrific game for what it is. Uh, that is Woodlands, um, and thanks for watching.